Hello everyone, my name is Roy Jafari and I would like to welcome you to another video. This is going to be our third video regarding CRISPR. In the past two videos, first we talked about what is CRISPR, this framework, very useful framework. In the, uh, after that, in the second video, we talked about one of the stages, very important stages of CRISPR, which was business understanding. In this one, we are going to talk about another important step, which is data understanding. Um, so uh, in this video, firstly, we will go over shortly what we have already discussed so far in about like a minute. And after that, we dig deeper into data understanding. Specifically, we are going to talk about nine questions that when we talk about data understanding, we want to have be able, we want to have been in, we want to be able to uh, answer those questions and uh, in this video we're going to go over a case study over which we'll answer those nine questions and that would be uh, a practice at the same time uh, the meaning of those five those nine questions will become more transparent for you <coughs> all right so before we get started i would like to bring your attention to the first video which was you know the general crisp dm framework um this is available on YouTube if you want to watch it. And then in the second video, we talked about specific one of the stages of CRISPR, which is business understanding. This is also another video. And this is the third video we are making on this series. Uh, we're going to continue making more videos about CRISPR. All right. So the case study that we used in the previous video of business understanding was this credit card transaction fraud detection. Basically, we want to harness the power of data and technology to be able to, um, you know, create a solution, create a data solution that uh, can, uh, with the least possible cost for us to, uh, you know, predict if a request transaction that's coming through a pose, a credit card request is fraudulent or not. Uh, pay attention, we're doing this, we have to do this in, in, in seconds, like two, three, four seconds, all right? So this is the case study, and we did talk about the case study like in depth in the previous videos. And this is the CRISP DM. Um, it has business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, deployment. And in the previous video, we talked about business understanding. What we did basically about this case study, credit card um, fraudulent detection, and basically we answered these five questions. And if you are able to answer these five questions, you could say that you've achieved business understanding. The data understanding, which is this video, so the new content starts from now, is very similar to business understanding from two aspects. First is the fact that it gets, it tends to get um, underestimated, right? You know, you, uh, it's similar to business understanding. You, every time that, you know, everyone wants to start, uh, sort of like start using this framework, while well, I do have the business understanding, right? What is the check and check balance? What is the measurement for you to make sure that you do have the correct business understanding? And those five questions provides you with that. If you can answer these five questions, then you do have the required business understanding. If not, then you have to be able to find the answer to these questions. And then once you do, then you do have the business understanding for the CRISPR. Then with the data understanding, we have nine questions. And again, if you have scrolled up and down on your data, uh, you know, the, and the, the, the values make sense to you, um, you do have some data understanding. It's ne not necessarily enough, right? So in this video, I'm going to provide these nine questions that uh, if you go through them and if you can answer them, then you can claim that you do also have the data understanding aspect for the CRISPR. All right, so let's go over these uh, nine questions with uh, in, about this case study. The first question is, what are possible sources of data useful for this case study, right? So for us to be able to answer this question, we have to have covered our business understanding. We have to have a good understanding of our business understanding, what it is that we're trying to solve. And then, based on our business understanding and our understanding of the business environment, then we can come up with some possible data sources that can be useful, right? So in this case study, there are three uh, 
data sources that immediately are useful and uh, you know without a doubt we can agree that these are useful data sets uh, data sources uh, to be able to provide value for uh, detecting credit detecting fraudulent credit card transactions the first one is where the transactions are this is the transaction database right this is every time uh, anyone uses your credit card as if you're the company if you use your credit card and they send you a request regardless of the fact that the request was approved or not if you send a text message to your customer or not the transaction is recorded in the transaction database right so that's one source that certainly is important there you've got the amount of the request you've got the location of the request at least the um sort of like uh, the uh, requester like you know the location they pose that requested this uh, the customer who's requesting this the card that is associated with this request um, and also you've got the uh, the types of purchases that is coming with the request right so uh, you've got these um, and also you've got the time so these are the sort of like transaction uh, data source and then you also have the cell phone apps database right this one is if your customer uses your cell phone's app right your um, you know the app that you provide for them if you are if they're using it and uh, they have their um, let's say uh, location sort of like open to you you can also track their where they are that's also can be another source of data that you can be using for this credit card fraudulent detection and then lastly is the customer database like you know in this one you have the information about the customer their associate uh, demographic uh, um, information uh, about their um, you know general income their credit score um, any type of information that can uh, sort of like indicate a risky behavior you might be able to find it from the customer database right so these are the three possible data that uh, can be helpful in um, detecting fraudulent credit card transactions. All right, so that was the first question. On the second question, we also want to, once we recognize those three um, data sources, we also want to be able to answer, how is each source of data collected? What is the collection procedure? What is What, what happens behind the scene that data is collected? And this is very important because uh, this is where we can rely on if we know we can start um, having some assumptions about the data so let's go over these three together like one by one and talk about how was each of them uh, collected so the transaction data this one is collected when the request comes and you know also if we know more about the request in the future it gets updated so it's basically actually a transaction so once the request comes it just if you have a row for it it might get updated in the future so that's the uh, transaction database the app data this is basically uh, every time you know the user is using you know their behavior on on the app or like what they're looking at what how often they look at um, and also um, let's say every five minutes their uh, gps location if they are if they are uh, letting you uh, see uh, if they are they have that open to you to record their uh, location so that's also how they are recorded it's basically the database that supports the app and then the customer database uh, depending on how the customer uh, was onboarded if it was a online application or if it was a phone application you know either the customer or your um, employee uh, sort of like fill out a form with the information that needed for the customer to be onboarded and that would be the way the uh, data of the customers are collected all right so the third question what are the volume variety velocity levels of each source of data this this these are the three v's of big data and when we start thinking about CRISPM, thinking about being able to provide value from data, we also want to understand these three Vs for each source of our data, right? So let's go over that. So with the transaction data, um, the volume 
is pretty high, right? So each of our customer, let's say we've got 100,000 customers. Each of our customer may be using our cards for purchases like five times a day, like on average, like, right? So our velocity would be around uh, 500,000 500, a day, right? So that would be the velocity. So um, it's uh, pretty fast, right? So for, for I mean, also at the same time, we have to pay attention that this is relative. Like we have to, when we think about the velocity, we have to sort of like think, think about it in, in, in relative to other data sources. Uh, how about the volume and variety? The variety of this transaction data, it's not that much. Like, you know, we know specific columns. We know specific information about transactions that we uh, would be uh, sort of like having. And the, the volume of it is also high because of its high velocity. Uh, the cell phone apps data, the variety of it is high. You know, all types of behavior on the app, if you're recording it, uh, could be high variety of different types of activity that you are using and also you can like connect that to other third-party databases if you can connect it with their IP address of using and you could sort of connect to the date to the to their uh, the, the internet usage so that could lead to a lot variety of information and the velocity of it actually the GPS one every five minutes or even like faster every like 10 seconds five seconds you're getting a new gps location and that's a very high velocity um, and because of the high velocity you also are going to have high volume the customer database this one is actually the lowest velocity and lowest um, volume of among all of these three sources because you know you've got 100,000 customers and you know Every now and then you uh, gain more customers and sometimes you lose customers, right? And among all of these, uh, because the customer is the base, uh, the cell phone data and transaction data, they are like more than the customer. That's why you've got more volume and velocity. All right, so now we have a better understanding of the volume and velocity. Now let's take a look at the fourth question. What are the assumptions made in recording each values in each source of data, right? So. This question is a large question, right? So there are a lot of things that are assumed. If we can answer the second question, how is each source of data collected? We can start having some ideas about this question, right? So let's go ahead and talk about a few assumptions of each of these sources of data. We cannot go through all of them, but let's just talk about a few of them. So for instance, with the transaction data, a big assumption is the fact that every time a transaction is on in our database this transaction is coming from a legit um, requester right the requester is not imitating another requester right so we are assuming that the requester that the pose that they're using is legit and it's verified it's correct and that might not be the case right so that's one assumption that uh, we kind of have to have when we engage in this type of ana analysis. A, a, a big assumption with the cell phone app database, right, would be assuming that the, the, the cell phone of our customer is with them at all times. This is a good assumption most of the time. However, not always, and sometimes it actually can be the source, the way that our system can be deceived, right? So let's say um, a burglar has marked our customer and you know their cell phone with the credit card is with the mugger. So they go around, they you know start using, giving, sending us fraudulent, actually fraudulent requests. And because we are matching the pose location with the cell phone location, we, say, okay, we, we might think, okay, this is good, but these are fraudulent, right? So this is another big assumption that we have to watch for. The customer database, the assumption that we are having is that the customer is honest about their income, about their other aspect that they share with us, right? That's also an assumption that we're having. All right, so um, like I said, there could be more assumptions about each of these data sources, but like I said, we just talked about one of them for as an example to understand this question. The fifth question, what are the legal and ethical implications of using each source of data? 
right so as we start becoming a more data driven society there are more and more regulations and sort of rules of thumb as far as how much we can push to take advantage of data right so right now the biggest two legal frameworks general data protection regulation gdpr which protects uh, european citizens and also california consumer privacy act ccpa that protects um, california residents so we have to make sure the way we are using data conforms with these regulations if the subjects of our analysis subjects of our data are either european citizens or california residents so for instance um, in gdpr uh, the way we use data has to be agreed by european citizens if they have not agreed for us to use their gps location for the purpose of verifying if we can accept their um, credit request or not we are not allowed to use it and that's why we have to be able to answer this question in the data understanding part of CRISPR. all right so let's move on uh, the another question we have here what kind of value do we normally get in each column in every source of the data right so in this one we want to have some sort of um, sort of like idea of the types of values and the range of values we get uh, on each these source of data right so for instance with the transaction data uh, what we are going to get would probably is going to be the requester id it's going to be the amount so the amount will be not a negative number it would be from you know something larger than zero and it can be as high as you know we can imagine someone would be purchasing um, with their credit card right, so these are the amounts so we are not going to get negative number right so we're not going to get um, uh, sort of like crazy high number larger than their credit limits so um, this is the for, sort of for us to be able to like expect what type of value we should be seeing right so with the cell phone app data uh you know if the customer lives in california we would expect to see um you know locations in california uh, except if they are traveling right so that's again another example of the type of value we'd be seeing so in the gps location we would be expecting to see values that look like longitude, latitude, and altitude, right? So those are the types of values we expect to see. And uh, with customer database, we would be expecting to see, um, you know, their, for instance, their marital status, you know, married, single, but not. All right, the next question. Where is the data source in the spectrum of raw to fully processed data, right? So this is also very important for us to understand. When we look at these numbers that there are in the data are these numbers fully raw data or are these are these calculated so let's go over the difference between raw data and process data of course this is an spectrum it's not we cannot say this is absolutely raw data and this is absolutely process data it's basically in comparison with one another but the three characteristics of the raw data is that the raw data are collected from the source uh, there is minimum number of assumptions about them, right? So the, only enough assumptions for us to be able to count to, to measure them. And the measure is the most most atomic possible, right? So we have the uh, sort of like what we are measuring, we cannot be measuring any entity smaller than this entity, right? So for instance, you know, I can be measuring uh, the salary of um, you know an individual and can also be me measuring the income of the household right so the most raw value would be the individual the salary of the individual compared to the uh, household uh, income because household income does include more than one people this therefore that's less raw than if we were to calculate the most atomic measure that <laughs> so next the three um, characteristics or the three things that set aside process data from the raw data is that it's not cal it's, it's calculated from the raw data not the source right so that's process data it 
it engages more assumptions than needed and then also it uh, measure more complex entities like I said individual versus the um, household so in this example um, most of the data that we have are raw um, except for instance you know a, an example of process data would be if we calculate the debt to income ratio from for our customers right so we um, check their credit scores and calculate their debt to income ratio right that is a calculator we grab the debt we grab the income and we calculate that and that's a very important metric and measure for how risky someone is as far as their financial health so that's process we're using raw data and we're sort of adding some assumption and then create a new measure which is more complex and now we've got the process data another question how each source of data could be useful All right so this is also important to be able to answer because when we start modeling if we don't know why a data could be useful we might not be able to sort of like, like pieces of puzzle put the data in the right possible location they were used in the right the right way so for instance the transaction database uh, could be useful uh, because the pattern in purchasing the general patterns and also the patterns of the customer as far as how much they buy what they buy uh, things like that can be used to see if something is fraudulent or not with the cell phone data specifically with the gps location if the customer is in the same vicinity as sort of like you know where they are where they live that could be an indication that probably this is this is good or if the customer has traveled and then we also see a request coming from the new location this also could be an indication that the request is okay so that's another type that we could be using the cell phone information data the customer database you know figuring out the risk factors such as the debt to income ratio if a customer is if it comes through that the customer is a responsible customer we might be less um, careful than if you know from the data it comes through that they might be more risky so that's also another way you could be using customer database the last question um, is really kind of a sort of like a checkbox right so have you been given access to meaningful samples of the data source and spent time getting to know them so this is also the kind of a checkbox every time that um, you want to make sure that you've you've completed data understanding uh, what you want to do is that you want to spend some time with samples of data to sort of like you know create some visualization to sort of like look at the data to see the types of value it has the types of sort of like unexpected value you might come across and things like that and uh, that's kind of a checkbox right so if you are able to answer these nine questions about the data of a data mine process then you can move past and say okay i've got the data understanding card. okay in this video what we did we talked about more about data understanding i mean the data understanding you can say oh i do understand the data but we did see that there are more to it than it meets the eye right so we talked about nine very specific questions that you can see once you think about these questions and once you have a good answer for these questions then you are at much better position as far as the data understand so that's what we did we talked about the case study and we answered these nine questions about this case study in the next video what we are going to do we are going to briefly talk about the um, relationship between business understanding and data understanding the next the next video is going to be very short this one um, became a little bit longer because we had more questions to go over uh, regarding data understanding. All right, until the next video.